they've been called crusading rock and roll crooners, kings of the Celtic fringe, and mega stadium soul shakers and bringers of hope. They call themselves simply U2. This is their journey towards being the world's best loved band. on the notice board, Larry Mullen tried drumming up interest in forming a band. But I didn't think I would be interested in forming, forming a rock band. Mm. I mean, if somebody with an accordion had come along, I would have played with them, you know. Larry's recruits included Paul Hewson, Dave Evans and Adam Clayton, an unmusical bunch, but keen. I had heard of this fella called Paul Hewson, like he was fairly notorious. Adam was a new boy in town and uh, he used to wear this fantastic Afghan coat. The band rehearsed in the kitchen at Adam's place. Fans gathered at Bono's. Well, I can remember scutting home and stuff like that, you know, in the back of lorries uh, from, from Mount Temple. But, you know, for us, I think for you too, I think it should be said that there are a lot of people uh, in this city a lot worse off than we were. Hanging out with the so-called Lipton Village Gang, the boys would trade dreams and nicknames. Googie, Gavin Friday, Edge and Bono Vox, the one who couldn't shut up. It all started back in the spring of 1977. Uh, I was in school here in St. Fintan's and uh, myself and a couple of schoolmates decided to organise a, a live rock concert. Uh, we'd had the school discos and um, the, the weekly discos and we fancied a bit of live music so we, so we set about organising a, a live concert. We booked a, a band from Dublin who were well known around the bars and uh, uh, we got another local band to support them. Uh, a couple of days before the, the gig was due to take place, uh, around Easter 1977, we were contacted by this band uh, in Mount Temple School, a couple of miles up the road, who, uh, who told us they were interested in playing the gig. So uh, we asked to, to meet the, up with them. And um, so about a day or two before the gig, this guy called down to see me. His name was Adam, Adam Clayton, as I subsequently discovered. And uh, he presented me with a set list of, of songs that he planned, his band planned to play. And I had a look at the set list. It was a, a real mishmash, hodgepodge of, of styles. They were playing Eagles covers, Moody Blues covers. Uh, there was one, one song that looked hopeful. It was David Bowie's Suffragette City. So we agreed to have them on, and uh, we agreed to pay them 20 pounds. Uh, for the night. On the, on the day of the concert, uh, they were the first to arrive down. They were dropped down by, by parents uh, in their cars and they arrived pretty early. They were here ahead of most other bands. They, they came at about three o'clock in the afternoon, maybe four o'clock, and uh, they unloaded their instruments and, and hung around. And they also had a huge entourage of people with them uh, who all wanted to get in free, but we, we, we decided to charge them the 50p entrance fee. You two, or feedback as they were known back then, had a change of clothes. They, they, they changed from the ordinary jeans into a kind of whimsical, hippie kind of gear. They had capes and, and ponchos and uh, that kind of thing, dark clothes. So that's one thing that does stand out. The headliners were called the Arthur Fibes Band. Uh, they haven't been heard of since, and no one remembers them, but they were, they were a pub band. They did cover versions, Doobie Brothers songs, Steppenwolf songs, and they were popular in, in a couple of bars in Dublin. They were the headliners. Uh, the next band were a band called Rat Salad, believe it or not. And uh, they were a good band, hard rock band in the Led Zeppelin kind of vein, which is very popular. It was early 77 and it was the year of punk, but, but punk hadn't really taken off yet. So hard rock and uh, West Coast kind of rock was still very popular. Uh, Rat Salad contained a member, uh, a guy called Jack Dublin, who would subsequently join a band called Intua Nua who became the first band to appear on U2's uh, mother record label. So there was a connection there that, that happened a couple of years later. Uh, but uh, feedback came on about, they came on stage about eight o'clock, 10 past eight, in almost total darkness. Uh, there was a row about the lighting system. The main band had brought a set of lights. They wanted to use them. They didn't want the other bands to use them. So we managed to persuade them to let uh, feedback use a couple of spotlights. So they're in almost total darkness. Uh, they had a bit of a following. They had the people from their school who came along, uh, Mount Temple, uh, their colleagues, their schoolmates from Mount Temple. And they gathered around the stage reverentially and, um, and supported their band. And uh, what I saw was, uh, it was a little bit shambolic. Um, like the set list I, I'd seen a couple of days earlier, uh, it was all over the place. They were doing uh, uh, rock songs, folk songs, country songs, country rock, that kind of thing. Uh, but they sounded okay, and, and they were 
pretty confident and energetic and, and jumping about the place. Now renamed at the hype, they entered a talent contest in Limerick, where they won £500 and studio time for recording a demo. There was a market in the city centre on St Stephen's Green called the Dandelion Green. It was basically a half-covered flea market. And I was aware of you too because um, it was the sort of early punk days and I worked with the um, entertainment departments in UCD and Trinity, the two uni big universities in the city at the time. I was very aware of U2 as being one of those bands that was always trying to get a support act. As it turned out, they couldn't that often get a support act because, um, I don't know, for various perceptions of them and there were a lot of other good acts around. So what they used to do was do a um, free gig on a Saturday afternoon in the Dandelion Market in what was uh, basically an abandoned stable. The um, walls were dripping wet and the uh, ceiling leaked and um, you could be standing in um, you know sort of two inches of rainwater while you were watching them play but i remember them doing that you know you'd wander through buying something or on a saturday afternoon something spend some time nip in cringe At the time, the, the, the punk ethos was that anybody could get up and play, and um, that was essentially what they were doing. They were taking that verbatim and getting up and playing. It was in May 1978 at the Project Arts Centre that Paul McGuinness first saw U2 perform live. He was greatly impressed. Well, Paul McGuinness, uh, at the time, I think he was managing a, a traditional rock band called uh, Spud believe it or not, and uh, he wasn't well known, he'd been involved in the music industry, in the film industry as well. I think certainly um, Paul McGuinness, uh, you, you can never underestimate that there's a kind of, again, the group dynamic is, has always to be considered in terms of U2 because the other, the other four are not puppets and never, certainly, certainly have never been. They chose Paul McGuinness, he didn't choose them. And it was, it was vital that they were in charge of their own affairs, and they are in charge of their own affairs. He was introduced to you 2 through a journalist, a local journalist called Bill Graham, um, the late Bill Graham, who uh, was uh, one of the founder members of Hot Press, and anyone he met, he, he tried to, um, he tried to uh, stir some uh, enthusiasm about the band, and he knew Paul McGuinness uh, through uh, Trinity College, and uh, he persuaded Paul McGuinness to take a look at the band. They went out. Um, sought this guy out, talked to him, you know, played him their music, discussed their thoughts, discussed their ideas, and I assume, given what I know of Paul McGuinness, um, he saw sort of kindred spirits, and uh, for that reason, he does deserve the, um, the, the title he's often given as the fifth member of, of U2. Um, I think Paul has a breadth of vision, all right, and I think Paul had perhaps a commercial, a better commercial grasp than what the rest of the band had. But regarding what U2 uh, were, U2 were always U2 before Paul McGuinness ever existed. So he didn't create Paul, he didn't create U2, but he made them what they are today. Now renamed again as U2, their passionate live performances of Bono's songs gained them a growing following of fans and some influential local admirers. They did get very good support from certain elements in the media. I mean, from Dave Fanning, uh, uh, disc jockey, you know, I mean, he played them on his, on his shows from the very beginning um, in Ireland. Uh, Hot Press supported them from the very start. Bill Graham in particular, the late great Bill Graham, you know, wrote about them assiduously and with great belief and conviction from, from day one. Uh, Neil McCormack, who was a, had been a friend of theirs, who had been in school with them, wrote about them as well. And it wasn't as if that, you know, the point was that to advertise U2 to Ireland. I mean, in a sense, that wasn't what it was about. It was actually feeding U2, uh, nurturing them in their own place. 
allowing them to see what they were to mirror the back to them, what they were doing, to make them understand better, to grow and to develop. That was what was important about it, you know, that they needed that. And that, that in a way, again, they probably wouldn't have happened if those things hadn't been in place. And they, those in turn were part of a kind of a cultural revolution, you know, that, that happened in the 70s, you know, where you had for the first time a music magazine which dealt seriously with rock and roll hot press. You had a rash of pirate radio stations in the mid-70s, and then you had legalized radio, uh, uh, music radio for the first time. It's incredible that people that, you know, find this hard to believe, but you didn't have, up to 1979, a legal music station in Ireland. We need to go back to the context and see you know, what they had to overcome to get where they got to. After playing support to the Stranglers to pack Dublin houses, you too had a sad London debut. They were billed as V2 and only nine people turned up. There was uh, behind the scenes a lot of friendship going on there between the Irish bands particularly when they went to London uh, in the early days because you had, um, uh, you had say, Tim Lizzy, uh, Phil Lynch, who was a big help to um, the Boomtown Rats. Even although Tim Lizzy wouldn't have been considered part of the punk movement, they were uh, certainly, they identified themselves considerably with punk far more than a lot of their other heavy metal counterparts at the time. Um, but Philo would have done it just on the basis that he was Irish anyway, and he would have helped out the Irish, even although, for example, he was from a working class area like Crumlin, and uh, Bob Geldof is from uh, very, very upper middle class place called Black Rock. Um, you know, once it came to, in London, you're just a paddy. It doesn't matter where you're from, you know, you're still a paddy. So when they got there, they would have had help from people like that. Um, equally, when you two got there, they would have had help from uh, the Boomtown Rats and from uh, Tin Lizzy and from anybody else working in the music business in London that would have, would have helped them out simply on the basis that they were Irish working in England. Real recognition waited for them back home. They performed live on TV in a top ratings show, won five Reader's Polls Awards and secured an international recording contract. In the stadium dressing room after their tour show, they were signed up by Island Records. Two played their first major open air festival supporting Squeeze and the Police in front of 15,000 people at the Dublin Festival 1980. But the band's dreams and plans lay further afield. The U2 seemed to ha they had a strategy, and I, I, they're, they're, critical to this was Paul McGuinness, their manager, um, because a, he had a friend, Michael Dini, who would be manager of Horselips, which had been kind of a precursor, and he had, had the attitude that you know they were never going to break it big in London. So he'd taken them on tours in America. Now they never did finally break it really big in America, but the kind of template which they created was used by Paul McGuinness for U2, and, and they sort of thought that, that you know, they weren't going to go into the kind of like the punk wars in London and, and the enemy and sort of you know trying to shake off the ridicule of, of the, 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 the culture that existed there at the time, and they would go straight to America. To go to a, a country like America, where you can disappear from one town to the next. You can tour and tour and tour and tour endlessly. And all the time, the only person you're talking to, is the, or the only people you're talking to, is the audience that's listening to you. And that's how they got their audience. And they built it, and they built it very steadily. And all the time, that direct contact with those audiences made it a, a case of them being a one-on-one -on -one thing. Those people believed in them because they believed they believed in them, if you see what I mean. The audience believed that you too believed in them, and you too believed the audience believed in them, and it was this uh, uh, kind of a symbiotic relationship that grew up out of that. You know, they're not superstars that people put up on pedestals, they're just regular people, and um, they're playing their music, they're doing exactly what they want to do. I think they're saying what needs to be said. You know, no one else is saying it, but they're you know, making it known to the world. And it's it needs not to be popular to say it. Right. right. That open conviction about their beliefs and their truth and what they believed was the truth in how they did things and how they played their music, um, that was something that was 
probably far more embraceable for a young American audience, not that aware of uh, kind of a, I don't know, post-Labour government um, and, and early Thatcherite government uh, nihilism or, or negativity that was going on in, in Britain at the time. At the time when they started off to be an Irish band in London or in America or whatever, uh, well, in America it was probably to their advantage. In, in England it wasn't. And they, they had success in England only because they had success in America. And uh, it's, it's like um, they would have always been aware of that and always been aware of that, you know, part of their appeal was their identity and their identity was Irish. One of the great kind of achievements of you two in, was in relation to Ireland and, and to their kind of obvious ability to transcend all the kind of hang-ups and uh, limiting prejudices which kind of usually affect uh, Irish people about their ability to, you know, break out and make, make a go of it abroad or globally or in, in, in externally. Um, and, you know, they just didn't seem to think or to accept or even understand that there were such limits on them. Uh, you know, there is this mentality, you know, across all areas of Irish life, and then, you know, soccer being the, the most obvious and immediate one, you know, where, you know, we kind of for a long time feel that, you know, getting to the quarterfinals is, in, is a victory, you know. And you two didn't seem to have that quarterfinal mentality at all. They, they simply knew they were going to win. They weren't involved in the, the petty squabbling that went on locally or the sort of ideological warfare about what kind of music you played or they didn't seem to participate in the defeatism. You know, they were quite startling really, you know, in terms of, and that seemed to have arisen really is more than anything else from the community that they created, both within the foursome uh, and the operation which they built around that and also in the community of, of Lipton Village. War, which was also about love, hope and peace, was soon a hit on both sides of the Atlantic. It consolidated U2's reputation as a band of more than just promise. Under a blood-red sky and the unforgettable fire, and the music press excitement the band generated, made them a must-see act on tour everywhere. Live Aid was a critical moment for U2 and, and for Irish music in the sense, I mean, obviously Geldof became this sort of you know, massive global figure uh, because of his creation of the project and uh, at the event. Um, and it became, you know, for U2 that sort of catalytic moment when they sort of really, I suppose, broke through that last sort of barrier into massive global consciousness, you know, because, and there was that daring moment when, when Bono just sort of walked out there into the, uh, you know, and, and, and sort of really sort of pushed the, the, the thing beyond the point where, you know, uh, even his own band, man, the fellow band members thought it was safe. But there was this sudden, this explosion, this, this, uh, you know, of, of awareness of what Ireland had to offer. The event itself seemed to represent that, you know, that, that, that I believe that there was at that time, probably more so than now, but certainly at that time a very strong awareness in Ireland, an emerging awareness of the, the uh, connection between what was happening in Africa and, and, and what had happened in Ireland, you know, in the, at the time of the famine, and that there was some kind of folk memory which, was, which had been repressed for a long time because of the horror of it was beginning to be, be ventilated and to, to be thought through. Which again, I think, is very much to do with the whole mood that you two had about them in those years, you know, that, that really you couldn't not be serious knowing what they knew, as it were, you know, and knowing how enormous these, these, these horrors were. You know, we weren't supposed to talk about things like that. We were supposed to just sort of accept that the past has happened and that, you know, we shouldn't feel too bad about it and therefore not make the connections, perhaps, with what was actually happening elsewhere now. And you two just refused to enter into that kind of, you know, dialogue. The whole sort of uh, sensibility of you two, uh, in some way, I think, inspired Geldof. So, you know, in a certain sense, yes, Live Aid was kind of an Irish phenomenon in many ways, you know, that it actually was Ireland speaking to the world. Live Aid proved that, that music um, 
can unite people towards very specific ends. Rock and roll music is the soundtrack to change. It is at its most exciting. How interesting this music is and how prophetic it is and how experimental it is, not just in terms of sounds and words and all that, but in terms of concepts of human communication, you know, that they're trying out things all the time. How do you express these things in the modern world, in a modern idiom, you know, to an audience which is kind of brought up on triviality and, and, and irony and entertainment and just pop? I think for any person in any individual country, th their politics is never black and white issues. It's, it's, it's grey, brown, different colours of issues and the issues that blur one into the other and you can never um, say that all we want is peace because that's reducing the thing to um, absurd levels of naivety and yet at the same time it also reduces it to a very, um, I suppose, uh, an appealing simplicity too. And it, you can't deny the logic of, look, why are we fighting? Let's stop fighting. You know, the, the, as a sentiment, it's wonderful. Um, and I think a lot of people listening, a lot of people would have been divided over U2 down the years because they would have thought that something like Bloody Sunday, Bloody Sunday was a very naive uh, reaction to a very complex issue. A lot of songs are built out of personal uh, personal experience as well. So you look at a song like Bullet and Blue Sky, that comes out of a visit Bono made to Nicaragua once. And then you think, well, yeah, okay, I can understand it because he's talked to a few people. They've talked about um, American imperialism in Central America and the value of it and its, it's true um, reasoning and, and its true purpose. You know, there's never anything very simple about anything that happens, but it's easy to put it in a song as simple. And, you know, so, you know, big deal if they do that. If it's a good song, who gives a shit? The Irish Dream is, is about peace, and it is about peace on earth and stuff like that. I know it sounds a bit cliche, but you will, again, it, you'll see it in the likes of Bob Geldof, again, is, is another person who, who just literally came from Dublin, who didn't really have uh, any political aspirations, but saw something wrong in the world and went and changed it. And I think that is part of the Irish uh, makeup, is that it's very hard for an Irish person to, to, to turn a blind eye to, sit, to situations that are going on in the world. That are go and maybe, I think, a, maybe if it's a fault of Irish people, is that they don't actually see things that are happening very close to home, but they will see something that's going on on the other side of the world. Um, and I think you two have got a good balance there because they have got very much involved in the Sellafield campaign um, as well as being involved in the Drop the Debt campaign and things like that. So there, I think in terms of you two, there, there has to be an equilibrium there. They have to be involved at home and they have to be involved abroad, which, 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 which stretches them. And I think, I think that's why it's good with the Ali Houston situation is that Ali does take some of the burden off Bono himself by getting involved in charity work over here. Um, but Bono goes off and tries to save the world. Love the smell of napalm in the morning. I think I think they're scared still. I think that they were, that they went to such trouble to cancel um, the demonstration shows they've got something to hide. Well, given the number of people who buy their records, if you get Bono talking about your um, campaign, then you're going to make front page of a newspaper, and that draws publicity. I mean, that is publicity, and you're going to get on the nine o'clock news 
you're going to get on the front of the cover, the covers of the magazines, you're going to get on CNN, you're going to get on Sky TV. And, okay, so a lot of people might say, bugger it, it's Bono again. But at least you're up there, aren't you? And he's aware of that. When malaria is the biggest killer in this country, when children are dying of diarrhea, and uh, because the water uh, is supplied. How, how more effective aid can there be than Word. just investing in, in, the, in, in water? You know, it's one thing that you two have always done is that they, without overemphasizing the religious aspect of what they do, they nonetheless mine a lot of religious imagery and spiritual imagery to um, convey the meanings that they want to convey in their songs. And I think um, the way all of us have a quest for something in our lives that, that drives us on perhaps, something that we can never particularly identify. But there's something there that we feel we must do or do or, or achieve or get to or, you know, whether it's just a case of buying a new car or it's uh, a case of finding some kind of um, spiritual reconciliation with your lifestyle or whatever. Um, I think that is, is clearly thematic in a lot of U2 songs. And religion in U2 has become, was, become very, was very controversial uh, uh, around, you know, the early 80s, um, particularly around the time of October and, and uh, war, uh, those albums, um, uh, because you know at that time they were you know, expressing these things in a very raw, straightforward manner, and, and you know there was a sense of almost incredulity in the, what you might call the rock community because these things were anathema to that sensibility at the time. You know, I mean, you know, Christianity was identified with Cliff Richard, like which was kind of as far from the rock and roll ethic as one would, could possibly imagine, you know, and uh, you two seem to have no qualms or apology to make about this, and, and that made them sort of, you know, prone to either misunderstanding or sort of um, a kind of a disquieted silence where people just didn't want to talk about it. People would say, well, I like the music, but I don't really want to talk about the politics or the religion, you know, and yet when you got in close, you had to kind of face the fact that these things were connected and that there was a very sort of critical element of, of, of the religion feeding into the music at all the time, all the time, and has, has right to this present day, really, that whole thing, in so many ways, has informed their journey. The other three were, you know, and yet, you know, it seems, and that it's interesting, you know, that in le later days, later, more recently, you know, Adam has become the more straight-laced of all the, of the band, you know, and, and you heard he's the wild kid in the early days, you know. Without Adam, the Christian thing couldn't have survived in the band, and certainly without the Christian thing, I don't think you two would have been as distinct and unique as they are, and as they become, you know, and yet, you know. Uh, I think Adam was a kind of like a kind of a, a vaccine, which inoculated the band, to get, you know, against their own sort of sanctimony from time to time, you know, and managed to keep them sane and keep them in the rock and roll world when they perhaps were in danger of falling off the edge. Uh, so, you know, there's all the ingredients were there and and and, and at the start and 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 uh, makes sense now. There was fraction within the band because of uh, the religious convictions began to get a little too far beyond uh, the, the, the sort of cohesion of the group, uh, where, for example, Adam has often said that he felt isolated during that period. He felt isolated because the others were too involved in uh, perhaps something that was not part of the group ethic. They were making music that they felt was where they were at, but perhaps the dynamic 
was beginning to lose its, its impetus within the band. And naturally, uh, record companies, their only concern is the commercial, uh, commercial ethic involved is, are you making money? No, you're not, you're losing money, so bugger off. And that almost happened to them. And I think uh, something happened during that period. A, they began to get um, audiences that were appreciating what they were doing. Uh, B, they began to find that they had to resolve exactly what their group ethic was uh, because they could perceive a conflict within the group. And C, they had to make or some take some answers out of those out of A and B to reconcile C, which is make bloody make some money. You know, people sort of say, you know, what's you two about and all that kind of stuff. And it's really you make a record and then you've got to take it out and stand in front of people and perform it. And if it's not a good record, you know on the first show. And who wants to spend a year playing mm -hmm. bad songs to people? So that's, you know, that's the most focused aspect of, of our responsibility is to, to actually produce good records. And after that, anything else is a bonus. It's long been known that there are collaboration between a bunch of people, not just the four guys in the band, but the producers they bring in and the music they listen to, the people they're talking to around them. So they're always conscious of new movements, new things happening. In their search for a musical identity, U2 had already tried out West Coast rock and punk. Might have been late 78, early 79, and it was the, the four or five tracks from Boy, and um, I thought they were really good. I mean, there was, there was a naivety, there was a... Uh, but a real sincerity as well that that um, you probably only heard with bands like um, The Clash, um, Buzzcocks maybe, at the time. You know, they just they just had something that uh, that seemed to, even though it wasn't exactly punk music, it was it was something that had a, a conviction to it. Their audience had soon become convinced too by both the album and its tour, which took the band to America for the first time. Somewhere between the end of October, October coming out and then war after it, the, that is the turning point. That's the first big turning point in U2's career, I think. And they didn't really make any money until um, uh, coming up to the Joshua Tree. Uh, they started actually making money and that 10 years on the road at that stage. You know, so. It wasn't like it was overnight success. It just went ballistic that year. And it, they were on the cover of Time magazine. Uh, everything sort of started going crazy. All the national newspapers, not just music newspapers, national newspapers started writing about them. And they moved out of the music pages onto the front page. And even to the financial pages where people were assessing their wealth. They blossomed with the Joshua Tree and um, they followed it up two years later by making this big motion picture, uh, Rattle and Hum, and very openly, very publicly began to explore the roots they always claimed they didn't have. And, you know, while a lot of people condemned the whole process that they went through as being, you know, typically naive U2 stuff, it was it had a sort of refreshing honesty about it as well because they were doing it um, and, and admitting that, uh, Jesus, you know, we didn't know this, this was what we were for or what, where we came from or whatever. And you can't divorce it from what was happening um, in the world at the time and that was the, the changing face of Eastern Europe and the conscious feeling by you too that they had to um, that having made Rattle and Hum, they had stepped too far away from where they, where their uh, sort of cultural essence was, and that was to, to, to be in some way innovative in, in the music. Through things like uh, the Zoo TV thing particularly was the, was the first manifestation of what people suddenly realized was U2 being ironic. Um, well, it wasn't just, it was way beyond irony. It was manipulation of a, on a grand scale, but 
It was manipulation turned on its head. It was the manipulation that was being used against all of us every day of the week, every minute of our living lives was actually being turned against. Uh, it, it was almost like it was a mirror being turned on itself. So you could, uh, you could actually suddenly see what was happening to you. You too is one part of a bigger group of people. And the other manifestation of that group was, was uh, the Virgin Prunes. And their theatricality, their avant-garde approach to what they did was the, the, the far left extreme of what you two actually were. And that became most clearly manifested in what you two did when they started doing that Zoo, zoo TV and Zero Tours. And the McFisto character is a character I would imagine you could um, attribute with, without much doubt, you could attribute to one of Bono's best friends, Gavin Friday, who was in, uh, was in the uh, Virgin Prunes, and to this day remains one of his best friends. A startling, challenging innovation that few could have predicted came with Zuropa, and particularly the total theatricality and spectacle of the pop. With these two mega shows, there were, however, some critical mutterings. Magic staging and message, but music a little hit and miss. I couldn't say that about the last album, uh, All That You Can't Leave Behind, which I think was a return to that feeling of innovation, that feeling of stripping themselves bare and starting all over again. Um, there is always a resurrection involved in every... You know, when you see you two go downhill, you know they're going to go uphill again. And Up and Away was what the Elevation Tour 2001 was all about. With the acclaimed stripped back, up close and personal, just among a few friends type London concerts, it appeared that you two had found their way home. In many ways, the grand finale of the European leg of the tour at Slain Castle near Dublin was a homecoming for the band. It was 17 years since they'd recorded the unforgettable fire in the castle. Now, 80,000 fans gathered to see U2 perform, where two decades earlier the band had supported Thin Lizzy and their friend Phil Linnett. I suppose that they have put Dublin on the map. They've never denied their background and they've written songs about, about the city and they've, they have put a lot into the city. They've invested in the city. They own a hotel here in Dublin. Um, almost after their initial, initial success, they set up a record label to help young Irish bands, mother records, and they signed a dozen or so bands, and many who, who went on to, to greater success, the Hothouse Flowers, bands like in Tuanua. So they, they did put back a lot into the city. Of course, being Dublin and the kind of city it is, there's a lot of backbiting and bitching and uh, that kind of thing, but they managed to rise above that, I think. Um, they, they'll always be open to criticism, some, some of it justified, uh, some not so, but uh, yeah, they are quite involved. Um, they get involved in the movie industry, they seem to turn up at every premiere. Uh, they have done special concerts for Dublin. A couple of years ago, they received the freedom of the city of Dublin. They did a, a kind of an impromptu concert at the time, so they are heavily involved in Dublin. The city has been consistently U2's base for their writing, rehearsing and recording. As with any band, their studios are their second home, and for U2 fans, these are places of pilgrimage. The old Windmill Lane Studios is rivalled in glory only by the Cavern in Liverpool, made famous by the Beatles. The studio premises have been, in effect, declared a treasured heritage site by locals and visitors. One of the Edge's favourite pubs on the dockside, and where the band would take many a break from work, has become virtually a relic-filled shrine, at which adoring U2 devotees worship. Apparently nothing sacred to the port authorities and the developers. U2's Hanover studio is no more. They're refurbishing the whole area up there and um, as a result they've had to uh, close down uh, U2's studios and they're rebuilding a, 
um, a large tower up there. I don't know, there's been a lot of press about it. We still have to see. The, there's a competition on, you two are running a competition now for um, architects to come in with their own sort of um, slant on what this tower should look like. And you two are going to own the, uh, the, the penthouse of it, the top story there. And the rest of it's going to be for a regular business. Um, the funny part about it is that the band, when they get together, I, I, they've said it on numerous occasions that they do fight. They do get, they do get into rows and they do get into scraps over, you know, creative differences. Um, it's going to be interesting to see, because um, to cool off the guys, the guys live were right on the waterfront, to cool off, they, they could walk out onto the waterfront and, you know, go and cool down. But the fact is, they're going to be trapped up on top of a tower now, so whenever there's a scrap, they're going to have to just basically stay in the same room, which, which will probably lead to a couple of different albums. Of the community of the four that you two are, um, and the story that, that, you know, at a certain point, you know, they all contributed to the beginning of the band. Larry put up the notice, you know, uh, uh, Adam was the guy who had all the records, you know, uh, Edge could play, Bono could sing, and all that, you know. And, but at a certain point, it became obvious to them, really, that the weak link in the music was, was Adam. And that was the moment when any other band would have fired him and got a real bass player in. But they didn't do that. They said the loyalty to Adam was so important to them and to the community and to the four that was there already that they, they, hadn't, they didn't even think about firing him. What they did, they worked around him. They closed in ranks around him. And Edge began to develop his uh, guitar style in such a way as to disguise the fact that Adam wasn't such a great player, filling in the gaps in between the bass lines. With the result that he created the style that became known as the Edge's guitar style, you know? And there's such an extraordinary parable there for human enterprise, that our weaknesses become, become our strengths, you know? I think that's, in a way, if I was to take anything from the whole, apart from the music, the, f the message of you 2 it's that, that they carry that extraordinary message. You know, what a thing to tell people, that no matter what your weaknesses are, they can become strength if you approach them in the right way, you know? That's a phenomenal message. They ha always had a problem reconciling um, the success and wealth with the way they lived in the city and the way they were perceived in the city. But equally, uh, I think part of, and I, I don't mean it uh, to suggest that they're kind of assuaging their conscience or something by doing it, but I know they've always been very generous to um, charities and they have always assiduously avoided uh, publicity in terms of what they do in, in you know, in it, where they, they have specific charities that they contribute a lot of money to. Uh, they do it on the very express condition that no one ever finds out that they're giving them that money, or that that money is going to those charities. Um, so from that point of view, that's a very practical way that they've done that. Um, but I, I think um, also they've, they've also provided quite a lot of employment in this city uh, either through their own studios or through the other recording studios that have developed in, uh, in Dublin or in Ireland. Um, I think they have uh, quite a few and have always had quite a few Irish employees. Those employees themselves have, begun, have gone on to become uh, world figures in the areas that they work in, like uh, uh, Joe Hurley, their sound engineer since the very beginning, is now uh, you know, he works for um, uh, OREM and a whole bunch of other people. Um, but, uh, you know, his influence would have gone all over the place. Uh, there are other guys, there's a lighting guy that used to work with them, whom I met quite recently, and um, David Bowie won't step outside his door unless this guy's lighting it for him. Uh, and, you know, he'll, he'll drag him into a television studio and bring him halfway across the world if he's doing an interview, and he'll insist. The only person to lie to him is this guy. So it, there's, there's, there's a sort of a, a tangible effect, but there's an intangible effect as well, and that's, it's given uh, hope to a lot of kids who, who are um, musicians, who are aspiring musicians, to, to understand that they can become uh, international rock stars. It, it's not impossible. Um, you two have proven that, and have proven that beyond a shadow of a doubt. Um, equally, they've given uh, an opportunities to a lot of people, and they've 
uh, created an atmosphere in this country where uh, this country has become a place where international acts will come to record their music. The, the ironic thing about success in Ireland is you only get successful in Ireland by being successful abroad. If you two never had got outside or made it in America, they probably wouldn't be has-beens right now in, in, in Dublin. Dublin is also where many of the businesses are based and where most of their collaborators and friends live too. The Clarence Hotel is, is literally, um, I, think, I think it's Bono and The Edge are major shareholders in that. And it's, it's, it's more or less a, a large celebrity hotel. When they initially opened it up, they opened up two bars. One was called The Kitchen, uh, which is a nightclub which is still open today. And another one was called The Garage which was more or less um, uh, a sort of a student pub which was attached to the, to the back of the Clarence Hotel, which they subsequently closed down and uh, built over. The, when, when, when these initially opened up, there was a very much, it was very much the place to be, uh, especially the kitchen nightclub, um, because obviously U2 owned it, and a lot of U2 fans, when they come into Dublin, or any sort of foreign people come into Dublin, the first place they'd want to see was U2's bars and U2's nightclubs. There's also the, the, the celebrity haunts that they hang out in. Um, so you, you know for a fact that if, if, if Bono and The Edge or have been out during the day or been out at a concert, you can be guaranteed that they're going to go to one, or, one of two places, which would be either Lily's Bordello or Reynard's nightclub. So literally you can, you, can take it, you can take it that the guys are going to show up there. So the photographers know they wait, they'll wait outside, wait outside the club and they'll show up. And generally when they show up, like The Edge or Bono, they will turn around, they will t let you take a few photographs and they'll go in and the photographers can go home. Um, and then when, the, when they're in these nightclubs as well, they don't go in with airs and graces either. They do are very, very much down to where people, they don't have security around them or anything like that inside these nightclubs, which is, which is very strange to see because you see a lot lesser celebrities from abroad in these nightclubs and they'd have three or four big, three or four or five big bouncers around them. I think, and I think that's what I, what I like Dublin as well because they can be down to where they don't have all this uh, razzmatazz around them when they go out because they have, a, they have their friends, you know, as you do, as I do. And when you go out, you like to let your hair down, relax and have a laugh. And, and that's the way the lads are when they're out, you know. They don't, they go out and they just have their circle of friends and they, they go out and they dance on, and dance on the dance floors and they, they don't, and no one really, I think maybe once or twice someone might glance over, but after that, as the night goes on, they just, they're just the lads in the nightclub. When Bill Clinton uh, visited Dublin uh, recently, what happened was, um, I think there's some sort of rapport between Bill and, um, and Bono due to the Drop the Debt campaign and stuff like that. And um, they were in the Clarence Hotel, which is Bono's hotel, and they were having a meal and whatever else. And they decided to go on to a, to a nightclub, a uh, spy nightclub in this case. They walked out and Bono said to Bill, let's walk over. Now, it's, it's a good 20 minute walk and you've got to go through, through the centre of Dublin to get from the Clarence Hotel over to Spy Nightclub. And, and they said okay. So Bono and Bill Clinton walked down the street. Um, security guards or, or CII, CIA guys were going crazy, you know I mean? They were all on their, on their earpieces and helicopters overhead and all the rest of it. And they, they walked along. I don't think people could believe their eyes that actually Bono and Bill Clinton were walking down, down Dame Street. And the funny thing was that the following night, um, Bill Clinton um, was, was giving a speech uh, in Dublin Castle, which is also on Dame Street. And the police cordoned off half of Dublin for this speech. And like, if, if they only knew that the night before, that him and Bono were walking down the same street with, with drunken people falling out of nightclubs, all the rest of it, I don't think they would have believed it. The way Dubliners deal with celebrities they encounter is, apparently, by ignoring them. Perhaps this makes it easier for Larry and Adam, who tend to avoid the limelight and value their rare moments of home life when not performing. A lot of, a lot of um, rock stars and movie stars try to play down their, their, their home relationship because they think it, it, it gives them, um, I don't know, makes them more popular with their female audience, their female fans. But I, I think Bono wants the world to know that he is a family man and he, you know, 
the whole rock and roll thing he takes with a pinch of salt and, and the, the family, the home life is very serious, you know. Um, and, he, and as well as that, he will stop and take, get photographs taken with him and Ali and him and the kids. And I think he very much wants the, the media to understand and the press to understand how solid that relationship is. Yeah, Ali keeps Bono's feet on the ground because Bono was basically born with a, with a God complex. Um, and I, I think a lot of Irish people, when they look at Bono and when he goes on his crusades, they, you know, they sort of say, what this, what's, he, what's he at now? What's this about, you know? And I think it's Ali is, is what, ba what brings Bono back down to earth, Ali and the children. Um, as well as that, um, she's absolutely beautiful looking um, and she's a very, uh, she is a humanitarian like Bono. So, and I think as well as that, she's the love of his life. So I, I don't think he could ever, I think, I think he's, sometimes he may get caught up in the whole showbiz world and go off and forget about the whole fact that he's got a wife and a family back home in Dublin. And I, I think he did it one time and he forgot about her birthday. And that's where the, the video for The Sweetest Thing came from, was an actual, actually to apologize to her. And it, I don't think he could ever sort of, it, to understand the relationship, the size or the magnitude of a relationship, I think that video is a very good example of it. Um, Morley, she was a dancer off um, the video, uh, She Moves in Mysterious Ways. And I think that's where it all kicked off with her in the edge. I think she's, again, she's a housewife. She, she, I don't think she's that much of a public person. Always orbiting around you two or in their vicinity are very artistic, very creative people. Uh, like Anton Corbin, the, the, the photographer, who has done a couple of videos as well for them. And some of the people that have made videos for them as well have, uh, funnily enough, Neil Jordan made a, made a video for uh, One Tree Hill, I think, uh, which has never been shown. And God only knows why, I don't know, I, I've never seen it. I'd love to see it. In the past, uh, Bono's worked with uh, Jim Sheridan on In the Name of the Father. There, there are about three different films happening at the moment and they all have tracks by U2 in them. There's Martin Scorsese's uh, Gangs of War, they've done the um, song that is on the title, the, the running titles at the end, it's called The Hands That Built America. A theme that would be very close to their hearts. Um, Neil Jordan's uh, The Good Thief, who stars Nick Nolte, uh, they've written a song for that. And Jim Sheridan's forthcoming new movie about his experiences as a young uh, aspiring actor, director in New York in the 80s. You had Adam Clayton and Larry Mullen involved in the Mission Impossible soundtrack, which was very, very off, wasn't really, a, the, the music that they put together was, was not very U2-esque. It was very much more to do with bass and drums, and, and that was a very interesting collaboration. It was, a very good, it was a very good song. So I'd like to see myself, Adam Clayton and Larry Mullen, get, doing much more uh, work in that area. I think that is certainly uh, a direction that you will probably see them going more and more in the future, where invent, uh, like creating music for um, cinema and television and, and documentaries and stuff like that. I think those are projects that they will find increasingly more interesting. I'm willing to be persuaded on this, but I, I don't see uh, those other initiatives as being important. Uh, the video, the film, you know, the, I see them as being experimental, uh, testing out certain directions. But to me, they will only be of benefit in the long term if they feed back into the music, which is the important thing. You know, I think that, you know, it seems to be, I say at the end of uh, the race of, of Race of Angels, you know, what is this about? You know, it's about like sitting in a bar, you know, at, at the end of the day. Uh, you know, in the point of despair or whatever, you know, and, 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 and hearing something, hearing a phrase coming across the public address system, you know, some, some line from a song. That's as much as pop music can do, but that's not a small thing. Um, and to, to make the quality of that matter, to make it as good as it can be, to take it into places where nobody thought it should be, that's what you two are about, you know, ultimately giving you that line that will save your life.
biggest problem you two have now is their, their success. That they become, even when it was thought impossible that they could be even more, become even more successful, they did. And that success kind of locks them in to a certain kind of pattern, you know, and until such time as they do with Beatles, you know, and, and you know, get a Yoko Ono to break them up or something, you know. Like, so, they, they, but there will come a point where they say, okay, we've done all that now. Now we're going back, and then we're going to start up from this point. And I have a hunch, probably a wrong hunch, but a, a hunch that it will be going back to dead, uh, wake up dead man. And that that's really the, the, the most interesting thing they've done, new direction they've done in the last 10 years. And that it wasn't ever taken anywhere, it was just left there. Um, so, you know, I think, and there's also other areas, I mean, to go back into the Irish tradition thing, to go back into that, and I, you know, I know why they'd be scared of that, because it's, it's been so abused, and it's such a, a dangerous territory. But there are straws in the wind. There have been other kind of artists coming out of the woodwork, you know, more traditional kind of styles, and, and more sort of authentic. Um, and, and, and I think, you know, there's something that they have to learn there, you know. But they will always, I think, find that new direction in, 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 in their own time and in their own way. I think the future of U2 is they are going to have to, at some stage, I, they have released sort of folk, folk songs in the past. I know, I know Bono has done some uh, collaborations with Clannad and Christy Moore. And I've noticed it in other, other sort of Irish uh, musicians that when they do get older, Sinead O'Connor is a good example, they start to, you know, to explore the whole folk side of of, our, of their own Irish influence and stuff like, like that. So I do see somewhere down the line, I don't know if U2 fans will appreciate this, but there is somewhere down the lo line going to be a, a folk album by U2. There is going to be an Irish trad album at some stage. You cannot predict U2. You cannot uh, advise them. You cannot sort of prompt them. You can only sort of, I suppose, reflect back at them what they're doing. I'm kind of waiting for the next moment when Bono will say, you know, that we're going away to dream it all up again. Wherever U2's epic journey takes them and us next, even if it's back to before their beginnings, exploring their cultural roots, we know that it'll be unforgettable. Bono will go away and dream it all up again. U2 will continue to be hailed as the best ever rock band. And Adam will probably still say, we're a bunch of noisy, rough Irishmen that are arrogant enough to drag their tails all the way around the world. And I think that's something to be proud of. Forget about the search for the next U2. U2 are the next U2.